Welcome to Scientist Warning TV. We're running a new series of interviews with younger scientists and today I'm really pleased to be talking to Robbie Watt. And Robbie is a lecturer in international politics at Manchester University and also a member of Climate Emergency Manchester. So we'll be hearing a little bit from Robbie about that later. Um, and I came across Robbie um, by an interesting article that he has written and he was tweeting about, and it's on the fantasy of carbon offsets. Um, and it, 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 for me, it had a quite unique perspective on carbon offsetting and what it means and what the problems are. And so I've invited Robbie to talk to us about his research, which is really quite multidisciplinary. So welcome, Robbie. Thank you for joining us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be researching in this area? Thanks for inviting me, Alison. Uh, it's really nice to be involved. Um, yeah, so my background um, is in the social sciences. I did a PhD at the University of Manchester in the Global Development Institute with a big project, um, Leverhulme funded project on the study of value. And that involved a few professors, uh, postdocs and a few PhDs, um, of which I was one. I was looking at the value of carbon um, and that led me to study carbon offset markets in, in some great depth uh, from about 2012 through to 2016. Um, and as part of that research, I did a lot of interviews with people who were involved in co carbon offset markets in different ways. I went to a lot of conferences um, mm -hmm. where people talk about carbon trading uh, in conference centers in Barcelona and Frankfurt. Um, attended the United Nations Conference of the Parties uh, as an observer, where you see uh, so many different things going on, but also discussions about mm. carbon trading uh, being very close to the UN negotiations. Um, so that was a very formative experience for me. Mm. Um, I eventually then uh, completed my PhD uh, in 2017 on the moral political economy of carbon offsetting. I basically argued that the rationales for carbon offsetting, such as they are, uh, get undermined by uh, implementation problems, uh, which okay. are severe and have proven intractable given the structure of the market. Uh, but nevertheless, people involved with carbon offsetting seek to defend the practice. They, they claim it's legitimate, uh, yeah. despite okay. the extensive evidence of the problems. So okay. That's so how I came into this field. <laughs> okay, no, that's that that that's great. That that's really interesting, and it's it's a lot to cram into, you know, because you're 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 quite career young. Um, I mean, carbon offsetting it kind of gives well, you know, for some people, I think it gives you that sort of fuzzy feeling of you know I'm doing something good. Um, but what do we actually mean by carbon offsets? I mean, let's just focus on what it actually is in the first instance, and then we'll kind of get into some of the problems with it. So. Um... The idea of the offset is that an emissions at source will be balanced by some reduction, avoidance or re removal or sequestration of emissions someplace else. Um, and it, to create an offset of carbon, um, you have to calculate the emissions at source. And then typically um, it will be balanced by retiring some carbon offset credits that have been produced through uh, carbon offset mm -hmm. certification processes. So that means that a project somewhere has submitted documentation mm -hmm. to um, a standards body. And the standards body will um, use certain methods to go through this documentation and then use some auditors to see if emissions have been reduced or avoided um, compared to um, a baseline scenario. Okay, okay. So it's it's a quite complex area how to create a, yeah. a carbon offset credit, but it's, it's, it's basically about retiring one of those to balance. Okay, okay. So I'm immediately thinking there's a lot of accounting that's going on here and presumably some clever accounting. And I think in your article, you talk about creative accounting. So we'll, we'll come to that. Um, so that's that's a really clear explanation of what's meant by carbon offsets. And clearly it's something that's been around for a long time and it's it's sort of intended to, to do good. Um, but there are problems with offsetting. And I was fascinated when, when I looked at your paper 
And then I started to look into a little bit. And I found you know, we, carbon offsetting has been around for quite a long time. And people have been talking about the problems with it for quite a long time. And yet we still, we're still stuck with it. Um, and it really came home to me with the, the Shell campaign where they talk about motorists driving carbon free, which, you know, I thought was an absolute fiction. And I think they had run into some problems with that campaign and had to remove, um, remove some of the adverts. So, but what, what are the problems with carbon offsetting? Just sort of, you know, some, some headlines about, you know, why, why it's not working. Um, well, I suppose the, the first thing is the accounting, which you mentioned, the, the creativity in the accounting. Mm. Um, so to, to create the carbon credit, you have to um, create a, a baseline scenario, a hypothetical baseline scenario of the future, which would have happened if the carbon offset project never existed. So um, this is something that's actually difficult to create. It's a, it's a hypothetical. Mm. Um, so when this baseline is estimated, there are uncertainties there. Mm -hmm. um, there are further uncertainties around the question of additionality. And mm -hmm. this is central to the carbon offset. And it says that this project would not have happened if there hadn't been an injection of an in financial, financial incentive from the purchaser of the offset. So, so, so when you purchase uh, and thereafter retire a carbon credit, that is the moment when you're said to have created a reduction or a removal that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a complex claim of causality and it often mm -hmm. breaks down um, in, in projects that are non-additional that we would say are quite likely to have happened anyway. So, yeah. So there's a couple of examples simply mm -hmm. um, which uh, highlight the uncertainties of the crediting process, mm -hmm. which are often exploited by um, profit oriented companies in the offset market who are less interested in being rigorous with the accounting and more interested mm -hmm. in generating um, carbon credits, which they can sell for money. Um, so, we have further problems with some of the particular types of projects. Um, we see often tree planting and yes. deforested deforestation, and there, there are specific issues with those projects as well. Yes, yes, I can imagine in terms of you know, availability of land to plant all of these trees and, and so on. So, yes, okay. Yeah. And often yes. it's people's uh, land that they value. Um, mm. So, it's often people in the global south. Mm -hmm. um, who are concerned that this could uh, lead to a, a global land rush or, or contribute to it. Mm. Um, there are many documented cases where um, affected communities have opposed the, um, the, the management of carbon offset projects in different places. So there are a lot of social mm -hmm. impacts that can be created um, alongside the offset. Yes. I'm reminded of um, it's a comment Kevin Anderson made, and he he he, he usually nails it. And um, he described carbon offsetting as a bit like trying to lose weight by paying someone in a poor country to eat less chocolate. And it just it just sort of captures it. It it it, it has all the feel of um, us the the global north exploiting the global south in order that we continue business as usual and we continue with our consumption. Um. So, so you've given, I mean, that's a, you know, a, a sort of good overview of the problems of, of, of carbon offsetting um, and what it actually is. What really intrigued me about your paper is that it, it goes into an unusual territory for a political scientist because you talk about psychoanalytic theory. Um, and then particularly you talk about um, fantasy. And I think the article is, is, is entitled The Fantasy of Carbon Offsetting. Um, and I wondered if you could say what you actually mean by that and, and so say something about the role of fantasy here in terms of perpetuating this notion of carbon offsetting, which, as you, as you mentioned, is problematic and isn't really working. So what, what do you mean by fantasy in this context? So, um, yeah, thanks. It's, it's nice to be able to talk about the article a little bit. 
Um, a, lot of, a lot has been said about carbon offsetting, and you mentioned Kevin Anderson. Um, he's quite a high-profile uh, figure in climate uh, science, and he's been very critical. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of different social science um, papers out there about the limits and problems um, of carbon offsetting and the tensions involved. Um, the question of fantasy, though, has not uh, really been applied to this case. So that's what I wanted to write about here. Um, and fantasy speaks to the way that um, ideology uh, takes its failures into account um, in advance. Exactly. That, and that's fascinating. And what, what does that actually mean, though? So uh, this comes into um, a psychoanalytic approach to ideology, a critical approach to ideology. Um, and ideology, of course, being quite an unfashionable word, uh, sort of Marxist ideas of false consciousness, mm. which mm. relies on some uh, sort of notion of a privileged observer who has access to the truth. Um, so this instead uh, takes a psychoanalytic approach drawing on uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis. Um, and Lacan sort of takes Freud and then he makes mm -hmm. uh, Freudian work uh, turn rather linguistic. Um, I go into some depth about this in the paper. It's, it's an approach that's been popularized by Slavoj Žižek. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how much um, interest the, the audience will have in the, in, the sort of, in the depths of this approach, but it basically points to the way that language and our efforts to symbolize the world always falters in some way, but it never mm -hmm. quite um, matches up. And we experience these uh, problems as a symptom. Um, we're aware of deficiencies in our language and our efforts to represent, represent the world. But we manage our symptom through uh, things like fantasy, which reconcile us to our practices, which are mm -hmm. flawed in different ways. And can you, can you give an example? I'm just thinking, because some of that's quite, it's quite a sort of high, you know, it's quite, quite complex. So is there, are there some examples that might help people to understand what, what you mean by that? Yeah, um, well, we can think about the, the issue of, um, of knowledge mm -hmm. and how that doesn't always um, dislodge practices that we know are problematic, mm -hmm. um, from um, eating unhealthily to uh, smoking cigarettes, for example, and knowledge isn't always enough to dislodge behavior or mm -hmm. better knowledge isn't always um, going to uh, change patterns and structures. Um, so we, offsetting is particularly complex. So it's, it's, it's especially hard for the general public to understand. So we might think that, that, that more knowledge will um, change things quite significantly. Um, but we can see those limits when we meet people in the market who are smart, who uh, know about the limits of carbon offsetting, but mm -hmm. their knowledge doesn't lead them to create uh, much resistance to its mm -hmm. practice. And that's understandable because the market will only tolerate certain amounts of dissent. Mm -hmm. uh, you may just upset people in your networks. You know, we're not we're not talking about the hypothetical free agents of, of neoliberal mythology. Mm -hmm. but we're talking about people who act within and as part of power relations. Mm -hmm. So what we start to see is practices of, of knowledge disavowal. And this is what happens when people know something, but in effect, they they forget or they they know very well, but still they may do it. They still carry on. And you, your paper gives some good examples of the ways that, that, that people do that, which I thought was really quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, so in the paper, I, I draw on some, some snippets of the interviews that I conducted with a lot of different people, mm. um, which I mean, I wrote about these in quite length um, in my PhD itself. But here I just wanted to take out little little components that illustrated um, some of the practices of knowledge disavowal, um, mm. people who are ready to admit that they don't really fully believe in the value of carbon offsetting, but that they will go along with it um, in some ways anyway. Mm. They, they may push back and try and improve things. I'm not saying that there isn't a reformist tendency within the market. There is. 
Um, but the reform efforts thus far have really struggled to resolve those intractable challenges. Mm. Okay. Um, it's, it's fascinating because you're, you're describing a kind of psychological, um, psychoanalytic mechanism, if you like, about, it's about, it sounds as if it's something sort of intrinsic to the human psyche, to how we actually function. And, and on reading your paper, it, it's, it struck me that perhaps there are parallels in other, in other spheres of environmental science, environmental practice too, in that, you know, carbon offsetting, as, as you say very well, is, is beset with problems, um, doesn't really work, um, but it plays into this notion of fantasy. So in effect, we're deluding ourselves. And I wondered if, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of talk about net zero, and I wondered if, if you thought that net zero might similarly be susceptible to this notion, you know, to, to notions of fantasy and, and to, the, you know, to, to the notion, the idea that we're deluding ourselves there as well. I think there's a, there's a lot of pushback now on net zero and there's a lot of debate about whether it's a suitable uh, term or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as the IPCC defines it, it's, Net zero is about a balance of anthropogenic emissions by sources against removals mm -hmm. um, over a specified time period. And, you know, that, that's a straight definition, but the way that it has been used and picked up um, by different organizations deployed in different ways um, creates a whole different set of, of, of meanings. And I think some of them are problematic um, and maybe there are elements of, uh, of delusion involved in, in the way that some people are using the term to make it seem as though we're on track mm. um, when things are actually really quite radically off course. Um, yes, I th and that's, that, that's, a really, that's a really important point because it's almost as if, again, it's a sort of creative accounting tool whereby you can, we can continue to emit today because we're gonna have these unproven technologies in the future that are going to that will scale up and remove it all. So in a sense, it's um, it's um, it's dampening. It's it's um, demotivating, I suppose, for people who know and hear about um, carbon capture and so forth and, and net negative emissions technologies, because it sounds as if we can continue to spend today um, and just pay the price tomorrow. Yeah, in the offset. Um, market which I observe still a lot during, in my research, um, we find that net zero um, has conditioned the, the market quite a bit and there is more and more interest in carbon removals, um, mm -hmm. uh, removals technologies, um, uh, carbon sequestration by sinks is, is, is classified as removals often. Um, and yes, so they're future oriented. Um, I think probably we'll, we'll need to have some removals, but those technological options have their limits. Mm. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of afforestation, reforestation problems um, mm. are also abound in those sectors. So it is tough. The other thing that um, we're seeing with, with net zero language is it's being confused through carbon offsetting. Right, okay. So um, you've probably heard the term carbon neutrality. Mm -hmm. This is what um, people who um, offset emissions um, may claim uh, mm -hmm. to have achieved through retiring carbon credits. Mm -hmm. They'll say that um, you, you, you fill up your car at the tank and that that, that, that tank will be carbon neutral uh, because you've purchased so, so, so a certain number of um, offset credits to mm. balance it out. In the IPCC's definition, carbon neutrality and net zero are actually the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so now you are seeing, um, um, although actually the, the offset people tend to use it differently. So now you're seeing a, a conflation of terms, um, which is leading to confusion about what these terms mean. Um, and even people who are um, working in this area are confused or sometimes deliberately confused. For example, Mark Carney um, mm -hmm. uh, misspoke, we might say, um, when he was referring to net zero, uh, even though he's 
um, doing a lot of work now on carbon mm-hmm. offsets. So we can see how these um, discourses are, are, are bleeding into each other. And it's creating problematic it's, formations sometimes. Exactly, exactly. And I think if you are a concerned citizen, as many of us are, and an increasing number of people are, then then hearing these terms must give some sense of comfort. It must feel reassuring. It must it must perpetuate that notion that somehow we've got this in hand. And yet, when you know, talking to scientists and um, academics like yourself, it seems that actually there's, there is there is no real um, comfort being drawn from any of this because it, it, it sounds as if we, ha- we haven't got this in hand, it's far, far from it. And so in, in a context where we're trying to mobilize the public to do the right thing, it's, it, must be, it must make the job of academics and scientists even harder when you have these confusing discourses out there. Yes, it is, it is confusing. Um, and I think it's important that we try to clarify things as much as we can. Mm. Uh, but it's an uphill battle. One of the things, if I could bring it back a little bit to the, the, the question of fantasy and, and mm-hmm. ideology, um, is, the, is the question of enjoyment and um, whether, we, whether our desire is somehow um, implicated in this. Mm-hmm. Um, so the argument is that some of our, the way that we perceive the world may be sustained because we enjoy uh, that way of looking or that way of thinking or that way of doing. Um, so it's about, it comes back to sort of trying to diagnose um, that what form of enjoyment are we getting? Um, some of the, the, the chat that we have now about offsets, carbon neutrality, um, net zero, it suggests that the, the point that of, of, of the problem that we have is, is emissions, it's carbon, that mm-hmm. there's excessive emissions, there's an excess of carbon. And we know this to be true, there are far too many emissions. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we could just remove them um, or get rid of them or have zero or mm-hmm. neutralize them, we see this in the language, then we could enjoy once again that we could that we could yeah. then come back to our forms of enjoyment, um, and that ultimately is forms of enjoyment that are promised to us through mm. uh, capitalism, through mm. consumerism, um, uh, and, and these things are marketed to us very regularly. Foreign holidays, um, especially us in the global north, with re- you know relatively high globally speaking incomes, so. It, it may be about promising that this carbon can be excised from the system and we can go back and reconcile ourselves to the enjoyment of, of capitalism. But this glosses over many of the other problems um, that are not just about emissions and not just about carbon, you know, colonialism, um, uh, racism, um, uh, patri- patriarchal relations. So there's a whole, there's a whole the host of problems. Of exactly. Other issues, you know? exactly. So, so boiling it all down to carbon is, is reductive. It's, in, it's, a, it's, it's interesting that you put it that way because it's almost as if we've kind of identified this, this um, evil substance and it's, it's external to us, it's carbon. It's not us, it's not our desires because they're all fine. The problem is just this carbon that we've just got to get rid of. Um, but that's a, that's a very dangerous narrative, it seems to me. That's a very dangerous way of framing the problem. Not that I'm not suggesting that you are or that, or that scientists are, but. But if that's what the public came to believe, then then there would be no no motivation, no incentive to for us over consuming in the global north to to, to do anything about that. You know, I mean, I I get very concerned about talk of, of um, you know airline fuels that that um, that you know that have very very low emissions and think well, you know, the problem is that is actually our behaviour, and you know, and why why. Why can humans not accept <laughs> that what, what seems to be a simple reality is, which is that some of us, a small proportion, again, as Kevin Anderson will say, a tiny percentage of people are consuming far too much. Um, and the enjoyment point that you make is also really interesting um, because I know in, in, um, in psychobiology, there's a distinction that's made by very eminent um, psychobiologist, Kent Berridge, between liking and wanting. 
So it's possible to actually want something and not like it. And I've often wondered if that's if that plays out in terms of our consumptive behavior, because we we want things, but in terms of enjoyment, we're not really having such a good time. Is that is that something that that that, that um, um, resonates with any of your work? Yes, absolutely. It's interesting you say that. Um, the difference between liking and wanting. Mm. Um, according to the theoretical approach that I'm working with, um, enjoyment is is it's never fully realised. Um, mm. That uh, almost like you know after after eating whatever it is, you you can kind of actually feel a bit like. <laughs> <laughs> you know that there's always there's always a striving for something more um mm. we, we may consume and, and be dissatisfied you know there's, there's plenty of literature looking at um mm. that you know that happiness um uh, it, it doesn't match increasing consumption mm. all the time um but yeah that the enjoyment is is imperfect and, mm. and incomplete that's very much um the approach that that i would take to this subject uh, but it, the question is how we enjoy. Um, yeah, yeah, when, it's it's fasc it's fascinating. When we when we think about offsets and and the risks associated with them, um, we're, we're we're going through a moment now where the offset market is is resurgent. Um, there's mm -hmm. a lot more interest in it. Um, they have, they have been influential in compliance markets in, in climate policy terms as well. So they mm. were included in the European Union emissions trading system. Hundreds of millions of offset credits were included. Um, they were eventually banned. Um, but we're seeing them in many other um, jurisdictions as well being included in California, Canada, Switzerland, um, Mexico, it's planning to use offsets. So we, we kind of have this connection between what's happening at individual level and when mm. we're we maybe offered an offset for, uh, for a flight, for mm. example, or some other uh, emitting activity. Um, and then corporates who are mm. using offsetting to uh, claim a particular status. And then, and then governments who may be tempted to deploy mm. offsets um, as part of their climate policy. Yeah, um, yeah, and this is this is something that we may see in the UK as well. There are hints um, that 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 the, the current government is interested in um, having offsets more substantially included in, in UK policy. So it's as you say, it's problematic, not going to go away, and let, let's hope that at the COP that it becomes a focus there, and you know, and that COP is a kind of get real moment for for all of us globally. In relation to the emergency, um, and on emergency, so you you remember climate emergency Manchester, and which sounds interesting. And I just wondered if you want to say something about what, what you're doing in Manchester. I mean, Manchester I know has been on the on the map for while well, Manchester Uni with regard to climate emergency and so on. So, yeah, I I got involved. Um, I've not been involved with them for all that long. It's it's mainly from last summer that I became um, more substantially involved. Uh, partly, actually, during the pandemic, when I found um, I was in a position personally where I had had more time because I wasn't mm. um, able to do some of the things that I would normally do um, in my free time. Um, things keep on getting worse, so that was a push for me that, um, that you know wanted to do some local activism. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that was important. And Climate Emergency Manchester, almost two years old as an organisation, they were running at the time um, a petition to Manchester Council, mm -hmm. uh, Manchester City Council, to establish a climate scrutiny mm -hmm. uh, committee de dedicated to climate change uh, so that action could be taken more seriously. And part of the problem at Manchester is that although climate targets have been set, including mm. a carbon budget for 2038. Most of that has been, well, most, but a significant amount of it has been already burned through within a couple of years. Mm. Um, so the, for the rest of the 20, 21st century, 
uh, already a quarter, perhaps more, um, has been used up within the space of a couple of years. So talking mm. about sort of net zero targets, when mm. you bring it down into budget terms, mm. which is something Kevin Anderson always talks about, yeah. the budget rather than the long-term target, yeah. you find that um, things are way off track, right. even though it sounds as though we have something planned for the long term, which will... Mm. Um, allow things to be fine so yeah the climate emergency manchester is about putting pressure on um, local governments um, and yeah building uh, groups that are capable of uh, putting pressure on at a local level and it's been very rewarding it's and it's interesting because one of the one well, i guess my next question to you is about it's, it's a thorny one in a sense it's about scientists and academics who 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 tend not to get involved in activism. Um, there are some exceptions, you know, I'm, I was with, with XR for some time and took part in various events. Um, but it's, there's a sort of almost a, an implicit or sort of unspoken rule whereby as, a, as academics, you know, you, you do your research um, which, and you make the recommendations, but you don't take a position. Um, but there are increasing calls by academics themselves that other that their fellow academics do get involved in activism. And, and I've noticed that there are a number of young, young scientists, young academics like yourself. And you know, I'd interviewed Tom Galen, um, Tom Nicholas, sorry, and Galen Hall, who are also involved in activism. Are, are you seeing um, are you seeing a trend here whereby younger academics and scientists are actually more willing to get involved? I think so. It, it may be different by discipline. Um, mm -hmm. It may be that um, some scientists feel that this would compromise them. I certainly don't subscribe to that view. Mm. Um, but perhaps it's um, more readily accepted that somebody in a politics department, for example, could mm -hmm. also be involved in an activist group. Mm -hmm. um, so... It's, it's there are still sort of lingering views that that science is a, a pure discipline unaffected mm. by politics. Um, I would not agree with those uh, mm. views of science. Science is political. Um, it mm. is it, it occurs within ideology. Um, it occurs um, within certain political constraints. It is it's constructed over time. So. Um, and, and scientists already have implicit uh, views of the world. Um, so I don't think that their science becomes tainted as a result, but I can mm. see why people might be worried about mm. um, people leveling that at them if they were also activists. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think with Extinction Rebellion, there's been quite a strong um, scientists component in that. Yeah. Um, and that may have shifted things a bit. Whether Extinction Rebellion um, will have longevity, that is a mm. question. Um, mm. That's been a bit of our, of a, our concern at Climate Emergency Manchester is that mm. um, the, the, the wave that came with XR um, mm. might be difficult to sustain over the long term, that actually what is needed is, is, is movements that have um, a long lasting effect that politicians know will be around not just this year but next year and the year after who will hold them to account for their promises exactly exactly and i think and that's I something think... That scientists can do can actually play a big role in yeah i i, I agree I, I agree very strongly with that um and xr has done a lot i think in terms of raising public's awareness of, of the crisis you know they've done a great job there's, there's no doubt about it but, but it seems to me that it's this is the time when academics and scientists really literally have to stand up, be counted. And I, I believe very strongly that if you are in a position of generating knowledge, doing research, generating knowledge about the problems that we face, then with that comes a huge responsibility. And you know, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to criticize academics and academia, but but I do feel that there's a responsibility to be taken that, you know, perhaps hasn't been perhaps we're not in that place just yet but you know I think that's where we need to we need to shift um so, so I very very much agree with what you're saying there um I just want to ask a final question then which is so for people watching this who might have thought carbon offsetting yeah that's a great idea um 
What, what, what's your message to, to people, you know, concerned citizens who tend to be the people who, who tune in and, and, and watch these, these things? And what, what can people actually do? Um, and how can, how, you know, what are your thoughts on how, how people can be more effective in taking action against the crises that, you know, that we find ourselves in? Well, I think anyone who's watching is already concerned and that's an important first step and it's, it's mm -hmm. clear that um, taking steps to be informed is is really important uh, because there is a lot of um, confusing claims that are generated through things like carbon offsets um, but there are and, and, and they will be pushed by people who want to see this market expand um, mm -hmm. I don't think all of their intentions are, are, are awful. I don't think that they're, they're awful people or, or so on, but there are a lot of challenges associated with offsetting and I wouldn't encourage mm. um, that as a form of solution. So I think, I think it's important to continue to um, learn and, and think about, think through the issues for sure. Mm. Um, I think it would be sensible to try and uh, join in with a campaign if there are relevant campaigns that you can mm. get involved with in your your area whether that's local regional national there are movements who are seeking to make a difference um climate emergency manchester is one in my area um but i know of, of many other groups or, uh, uh, in other places mm. even if it's not necessarily climate focused know that there are aligned issues um, where where citizens can make a difference uh, but I, I don't think that we make a big difference by choosing to offset on an individual basis um, I think that that actually plays into some of the power relations that we find ourselves in which are helping to, to stick us into a, a really um, uh, sticky situation <laughs> with the climate crisis and yeah. that we have to unstick ourselves and we have to try and do so collectively um, and I think that's certainly what I found with climate emergency Manchester is that there's a really great um, group of people involved mm. find other people who, are, who want to make a difference um, and that rather than the individualizing logic that um, offsetting offers this is about a collective um, co somewhat coordinated, loosely coordinated resistance to the climate crisis. I think you put it really well, and and as as you were saying that, I was reminded of um, um, some points that Michael Mann makes in his book um, and in various presentations, which is that you know the discourse now is about pointing the finger at us as individuals and saying it's our fault. You know, we've got to change which is kind of a bit of a deflection because actually it's, it's, I mean, yes, it's our collective behavior that's the problem, but, but we can't simply, um, we can't um, um, convince ourselves that just by offsetting that that, that, that in, in itself will be sufficient because quite clearly it won't, you know, we have, we clearly have to put big pressure on and, and um, you know, it's all about policy changes now that we, you know, radical policy changes and shifts that we now need to see. Um, Okay, so well, um, thank you, thank you for um, for that. Thank you for talking to us about your research on offsetting. It's been very illuminating. I, I do think it's super interesting that you, you know, that you're taking this psychological um, approach in terms of understanding this. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Robbie. Um, and for anyone watching this recording, I um, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you'd like to get some updates on our following interviews, then please subscribe to our channel. Um, and share this if you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Awesome.